Last time on Dragon Ball Z, Bobby was elated to reveal that after an update from a certain orange haired brick house, he would be making a brief visit to the Capsule Corp estate in order to do a wellness check on the living quarters of one of the three amigos. This was around the time Bulma reminded Goku that her dragon radar was a once in a lifetime piece of tech, and if it were destroyed by Bobby, they could say goodbye to the Dragon Balls and any chance of righting the wrongs committed by the Rodan Magister. Stepping into high gear, Goku ordered young Trunks to make his way to his grandparents to rustle up the radar while he made a direct fight to Majin Buu and Bobby intending to buy him the time needed to make sure the Earth's destruction didn't end up a canon event. Surprised at the confrontation but not worried, both Boo and Bobby mocked the Saiyan seeming bravado, ready to test the theory if a man could die twice since he was fool enough to teleport himself directly into their web. While the world may have been shocked, Goku was anything but, and giving him a brief lesson in Dragon Ball history, he prepared himself to knuckle up with the earth shattering reveal of Super Saiyan 3, a transformation he cooked up in Otherworld that he was not prepared to use to buy trunks the time he needed. After Goku finished up his flexing, Super Saiyan 3 was finally revealed in all of its over the top glory, complete with erased eyebrows, deviant art hair, and all the edginess that comes with a mandatory new transformation. I was having a conversation with creator and editor homie Seth Descent about this section, he was spitting bars when he talked about how sick as this moment is, it's like Toriyama knew just how out of hand the power level thing had started to get and lean into that mess as much as possible. SSJ3 is absolutely Goku's most flamboyant transformation yet, yeah, boy. The dude quite literally had the whole world watching him flex and strain for minutes as his key charge began causing the tectonic place to shift and his power level got so out of hand it could be sensed by gods more than light years away. Big bro Toriyama just said, screw it, if we're gonna do it, we're about to go all the way and I respect the man's dedication to the bit. Boo Peep Goku was like, damn, I gotta admit, you do look scary without the eyebrows. But he still was impressed. Bobby tried to pretend he wasn't, but made sure he was standing as close to Boo's crack as possible before talking spicy and telling Boo to sickle. And of course, you gotta love the reactions of the peanut gallery as they stand miles wide open yet again at another impossible Kakarot transformation. I know Vegeta was sitting on his iPad he borrowed from Trunks in hell with watery eyes just punching the air. Super Saiyan 3 Goku also just makes me lose it every time off that massive caca eating grin that's plastered on his face from the moment he transforms. It's like bro just can't help himself and is on a permanent self glaze street like damn I'm just really that nice with it. Boo decides that it's time to test out if all those theatrics really amounted to anything and rushes in to put in some work on the newly transformed beast mode Goku, no relation Gohan. It's immediately apparent that the transformation not only amounted to a key boost but a big old speed increase as well with Goku vanishing up in Boo's grill in seconds flat and doing what Goku does best when he gets a new transformation. You already know the vibes, man went full disrespect mode. Tell me why this fella Goku gripped this fella Boo up by his dangling, no puffy and decided to get on his Gervonta to Davis time and using this dude as a speed bag like he was playing a mini game of fight night. I said it once and I'll say it again. Saiyans with a new transformation are like homies from the neighborhood with a fresh cut. They start crispy creaming themselves like crazy and act totally different. Then once again in an appeal to ensure his spot in the next smash game, Goku starts with the grippies firmly on Boo's antenna and begins swinging this man Mario 64 style for a permanent swim lesson. It'd be a cold day in HFIL though before Boo let himself get permanently set to the sidelines off of something like that. So man hops out the water and pours one out for Vegeta, giving us one of our favorite clips. Seth, if you want mind doing the honors. I still can't get over the fact that this worthless key blast spamming is genuinely associated with the Prince and Universe and gets acknowledged by other characters. Bro, of all the things to be remembered for. After acknowledging the nonsense, Goku begins to peep the same thing that the late Prince did though. No matter how hard you duff this dude, Majin Buu, there appears to be no lasting damage. Boo wasn't going to allow the monologue to go on too long though, as he took another page out of Vegeta's handbook and stretched his arm to disproportionate lengths to sock Goku in the face from half court. After mashing out of the dizzy spell, Goku let out a little smirk as if to say that was dirty ball but I rock with it, before the two rushed in and just began back and forth blaming each other, one of Goku's favorite pastimes. This fella did not learn anything from Hajime no Ippo bro, you are not supposed to use your head to block, that's not how this works. Then without warning, Goku decides that he wants to test what this dude is really about and fires off an instantaneous Kamehameha right in Buddy's face. The beam lands direct and on any other occasion would have ended the scrap. But the rest of the villains weren't built like Boo was and quickly shoots Goku a smirk to let him know this was light work and heals himself back to full like the attack never happened. 
and Majin Buu might be one of the few villains that rivals Goku when it comes to levels of disrespect. Because why did this pink instigator, after taking that beam straight to the chest, just decide, yo, that was kinda cool, let me try. Put his hands in formation, then fire one off on Goku right back, cheesing the whole time. This part was actually so sick because it felt like a callback to the original Dragon Ball. Y'all remember back in the day when your mans first picked up the move from Roshi, who had spent years in the darkness, getting molded by it, attempting to perfect the ultimate technique of the Turtle Hermit School. Goku peeping is like, yo, can I try? Master Roshi damn near spit his dentures out. Giving a whole lecture about the number of years it takes to properly learn it while in mid-sentence, Goku was already in the process of blowing up a vehicle after peeping it one time. When you really look at it, the whole fight itself is very different from what you would expect when it comes from the series pro tag confronting the big bad for the fate of the universe. Rather than Buu and Goku facing one another to knock each other's helmets off like on most occasions, the two really appear to be more playing with each other than anything else. Instead of being upset or discouraged by Buu's genius level combat IQ, Goku's impressed and there feels like there's a little bit of relief behind his words, finding someone out there that exists that's still able to push him to his limits even though he's forever destroyed the Shonen power ranking system. I like seeing how Toriyama was setting up the finale even within this first encounter with Boo. I don't know if he had the full picture of the two's relationship and how it would end, but the building blocks were definitely there. After having the Kamehameha sent to him, Goku reflexively double axe handled the nonsense directly in the bikini bottom and ensured that one fella's leg was never going to heal properly. Seeing him pull off a city bus in Kamehameha after only peeping at one time, Goku couldn't help but glaze dude up a little bit, admitting that you look like you're a few fries short of a happy meal, but when it comes to throwing hands, you're an elite level competitor. It was pretty clear Boo was happy to hear this, but the excitement immediately went flaccid when he saw his new rival go all the way back down to Goku Black. Towards the tail end of the last round, Goku had sensed Little Trunks' energy returning to base and figured he must have found what he needed and bounced. Going back to the anime adding little color commentary bits that aren't always present in the manga edition of things, Trunks trying to find the Dragon Radar at home while his grandpa and his fine ass grandma are completely unserious is genuinely good stuff. Little dude is so pressed the entire time, not only understanding the stakes, but also not trying to get another lesson from Major Kakarot so the whole time he is back home he has zero peace. Little dude is sweating, running in place, the whole time his grandma keeps getting on his back about eating a sandwich and his grandpa's nonchalantly sucking down Newport 11s while he's trying to navigate his brain fog about where they left the radar. While little buddy is on his last leg tearing down the whole house to find where they put the damn thing, his mom calls after she remembers they left it in the Breeze family plane. 1% tax bracket problems. Trunks gets high key annoyed and channels his inner Vegeta, telling his mom that he doesn't have time to hear her complain about pastries or whatever, he's got a job to do. Bulma, refusing to let her son fall into the clutches of inceldom, tells him he better get his smart ass mouth in those funky boots and line this instant so she can tell him what's up. It's a silly little gag section, but it fits in well and is just another showcase of the things the broadcast team did really well to bring the whole vision of Dragon Ball to life. Back at the scrap, as Goku returned to his normal African American self, he informed Boo that even though he may have run out of time to play with him himself regrettably, there's going to be a really strong guy that'll show up in two days that'll be able to give him a real fight. If he could just hold off from going 187 on the planet for just a little bit longer, he'll be in for the most fun he's had since he discovered the husky section at JCPenney's. Bobby at this point was finished though. Really, Orange Man, did you think you could just talk your way out of this fade? Boo, go out. Wait, he's gone? Really? That seems kind of unfair. Well, now you've gone and done it, Majin Buu. Way to let him get away. I should have figured a numb skull of your enormous size wouldn't be able to keep up with him. Now I suggest- Hey, Master Bobbity, I got an idea. Oh, really? I suppose it's the first time for everything. What is it, you dolt? In an instant, Buu was holding Bobby in the air by his throat, gleefully smiling as he relayed what's to come. See, if you're choking, you can't do spell. I learned a lot from you, but now it's time to die. By the way, when you in hell, make sure you tell Vegeta I'm gonna give his wife a big fat kiss. And just like that, it was over. With the speed of a Mustang's pistons, Majin Buu unloaded a right hand with all the ill intent he could muster, aiming square for Bobby's face and literally exploding the dude's noggin on impact. I remember seeing this part back in the day and being like, oh shit. <laughs> like even on the rewatch and the reread, this moment still absolutely is kind of nuts to see. While it's a bit more graphic for sure in the manga because you literally see this fella Bobbity leaking from his neck before he gets tossed to the wind and blown away, I remember the anime being absolutely crazy too because they left this moment for the very end of the episode. Then when he did it, the moment before he gets his head Kenshi road, he goes first person mode from Bobbity's perspective and the whole screen gets a red filter like blood and all you saw was Majin Buu smiling like a demon. Pure cinema. As a youngster at the time was absolutely one of the most metal DBZ moments I'd ever been exposed to. Then you add the sinister ass next time on Dragon Ball Z Falconer music in the background, 
actual horror movie. Then the whole scene takes a tonal nosedive in the other direction when Boo discards Bobby's corpse like weeks old leftovers and immediately starts emoting like it's the best day he is ever gonna have in his life. Haven't seen somebody end somebody's career so casually since Kendrick started dropping his Drake EPs. This is an absolute bombshell. Goku, fresh from his transmission, standing back on the lookout, had to turn his head to the side for a minute and let out a nasty smirk after making the realization that his instigation game was still A1. Green peeped him was like, bro, this is no time to be spacing. We got real problems right now. I know, I know, but the madman actually did it. He boomed him. Bobby, I mean, that dude's whole key signature just fell down the tube and is nowhere in sight. People took him in and was like, damn, hold up. You might be on to something. So maybe we're good then, right? Without Bobby in his ear talking absolutely crazy, he might put a pause on all their race humanity stuff and give us the chance to get the boys in fighting shape. You know, Kamikolo, I'm always on you about being a senzu half-eaten kind of dude, so I respect you at least trying to look on the bright side. But I'ma keep it real with you, Chief. Half the Earth is still about to get turned into a makeshift pastry shop and ain't a damn thing we can do about it either. Majin Buu was like no lies detected and made his first order of business to play the harmonica on multiple city blocks before deciding that he needed to hit the streets for some reconnaissance to see what this Earth thing was really about. But he's genuinely just a Tyler with an OD power level, racing through the city messing up the whole floor plan just cause he's charged up and it's fun to do, no actual motive. Let me scratch that though, Boo found a motive pretty quick when he found his poor lady doing her best to become one with the brick wall and thought to himself that he should holler. After the absolute avalanche of fat jokes he internalized between the Saiyans and Bobby, Boo needed a self esteem boost, so he talked to the woman and asked for her to rate his drip. I gotta give her credit, she clearly sensed that an incorrect choice could possibly be her last, so she started gassing Boo up heavy, admiring the body game, asking him if his size schmedium vest was Dior, whatever it took to not have this maniac go ape. Low key, I know this what has gotta be partly what it feels like to be a woman in a public venue surrounded by where my hug at type dudes. Gotta say just the right thing before Buddy turns into a great ape and spends a block because you told the truth that he's musty and he's getting on your nerves. And just like the where my hug at dudes, when she gave Boo an inch, homie took a mile. Now telling her, since you think I'm attractive, how about you kiss me in the mouth so I know it's real? This part had me so sick because even though she knew her life was on the line, she pretty much told him, you just gonna have to clear me because I can't bring myself to do all that. I'm boo, my self esteem is in shambles. You know how tragic of a case you gotta be to be pressing a woman this bad and she just tells you I'd rather die? Insane work. But this fella boo wasn't done. He decided, oh, okay, I know what you went to. You like them sexy flexy type dudes. Dudes with an ascot, things of that nature. This man picks up a magazine and determines that, yeah, Earth Women type must be dudes with the face of a Ken doll on the body of Rick Ross. And then goes in for round two, determined that that's gonna do the trick. Poor girl almost fainted. At this point, Boo completely gave up, determined that his game must be absolutely trash and deciding, you know what, if you can't beat him, eat him, and turn her into one of the Werther's caramels your grandma keeps in her pocket for church before contemplating what other type of hood rag antics he wanted to get himself into. Boo gave it the briefest of thoughts, then came to what he felt like the most sound conclusion. If I'm not allowed to pull females, nobody is, and dust at the entire city block, determined that he was gonna make an example out of the whole homo sapiens species, before that tough guy, the orange dude kept gassing up, showed up. Up on the lookout as Boo was going on his red pill-fueled reign of terror, Goku and Piccolo observed the carnage down below and lamented their options. Goku, do you seriously mean to tell me that our only option right now is to truly watch this pink menace make a trampoline park out of the earth while we get the boys in order? What's to stop this guy from just saying screw it and detonating the whole planet while we sit here with tears in our eyes and our thumbs up our asses? Piccolo, you gotta be careful saying that kind of stuff. It kind of makes you sound like a freaky frog and you're already green. Oh my dear, grandma, you freaky as hell. Phrasing aside though, I don't think we're done for just yet. Boo seemed pretty charged up when I told him in two days a really strong guy would be coming to meet him. So I think worst case scenario, we got at least 48 hours before we go extinct. The main problem is me. Checking my Fitbit, I think I only have an hour left before I have to go back to being dead. An hour? What the hell happened? There's gotta be more time. Uh, so you remember when I did my cool guy Super Saiyan 3 thing down there? Truth is, it's kind of a form you should only use in the other world. If you do it in a place where time flows and the rules actually make some logical sense, it drains way too much energy. Sorry to burst your dragon balls, Goku, but it's actually half an hour. Your otherworld Uber will be arriving shortly. Ah, oh, come on, Baba. Now there's no way I'm gonna make that sneaky link with Chi Chi. The whole trip sucked. Goku, I know we're almost out of time, but I gotta ask you something. So when you did your super de duper super saiyan with the Majin Buu thing and all that, could you have just taken him out yourself at that point? I promise to only hate you a little if you say yes. 
Ah, uh, jeez, Piccolo, that's kind of a hard one. I gotta admit, I am kind of nice when I'm in Super Saiyan 3, but to be real with you, Majin Buu got hands. We're talking once in a lifetime hands, and I don't fully know what would have happened if we took the scrap all the way. Goku, I know you always accuse me of being that guy, but I gotta know. Why didn't you at least try to finish the job? We're talking about a threat here, not only that has the potential to cream our planet, but the potential to vacate entire solar systems without second thought if you felt the impulse. That seems like a pretty damn decent opportunity to go all out, don't you think? All right, Piccolo, twisted my arm. You wanna know the real rub? Basically, I don't go here anymore. Technically, I'm washed. I got put in a pack years ago, and it feels weird to me that I should be the one doing all the saving when I'm technically fish food. I think it's time I let the young bucks step up to the plate. Allowing somebody actually from this area code to put on for their city. Especially since you never really know when the next goober is going to show up. I know we're gambling right now, because both Goten and Trunks are about 15 cents short of a nickel. But with time, I think they can become the hero Gotham needs. And right here with Piccolo looking over his old buddy with the pride of a father whose 50 year old son was finally ready to move from home is where we'll call it. This part is interesting to me and I'm curious to know what the Z homie's thoughts are on Goku's reasoning here. Do you feel like Buddy was making the right call and wanting to allow younger generations to pick up the mantle and be the ones to solve their own problems? Or do you think it's selfish to not act when you potentially have the power to right or wrong but choose a different course of action? It's actually low key a really interesting philosophy thought experiment and definitely chop it up with me in the comments if you got some bars to discuss. Tune in next time y'all as the countdown to B-Day begins. Will the boys be able to learn fusion in the time Goku has before his Uber arrives? And if they do, is there any hope, even with their combined strength, to take down the seemingly indestructible Majin Buu? Only one way to find out. Be easy, y'all, and catch you again in the next video.